Hi. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about the radiometer equation and some of the other fundamental concepts behind uh, how radio telescopes work. So this is what we're going to cover. Um, radio waves, what are they? Um, how, uh, how are they produced? Um, how we look at radio signals using different kinds of, uh, of hardware. A um, little bit about uh, antennas, although that's going to be covered in detail uh, in another lecture. Um, and then the important concepts of, of uh, brightness, uh, brightness temperature, of flux density, which uh, what we use all the time when talking about signals in radio telescopes. Um, and then the radiometer equation, which is the fundamental equation of uh, sensitivity. Uh, in a radio telescope. So as you know, radio is part of the um, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, it's a big chunk towards the long wavelength end of the, of the spectrum. Uh, light uh, sits in the middle of the spectrum, just uh, a relatively small range of, of um, two to one in frequency. Um, but radio waves cover a much, much bigger uh, range of, of frequencies, uh, roughly from, let's say, a, a millimetre up to as long in wavelength uh, as you like. Um, and it's important to remember the distinction between electromagnetic radiation and sound waves, for example. Um, of course, electromagnetic radiation um, can, doesn't need a medium to support it. Um, it's a wave, a self-supporting wave in the electromagnetic field. Uh, it travels happily through a vacuum. Uh, unlike sound, which uh, is a wave in uh, a, a medium that actually has to be something uh, supporting the, the wave. Um, radio and electromagnetic waves are transverse waves as well. So the, the thing which is waving in this case, which is the electric and magnetic fields, points in a direction, direction transverse to the direction of, of, uh, of propagation. So that means that radio waves um, have polarization because uh, there are two dimensions in the plane perpendicular to propagation and the wave can be pointing in any direction uh, in that plane. Sound waves are what's called longitudinal waves. So the motions of the particles in, uh, in, in a sound wave are in the direction of of propagation, they don't move very far, obviously, the, each, the individual air molecules are just going backwards and forwards a small amount. Um, and so that means that sound waves are not polarized. And although we often draw sound waves as a kind of uh, a, like a, a sine wave signal, uh, looking a bit like a transverse wave, all we're drawing there is a graph of density or, or pressure uh, as a function of position. So, Electromagnetic radiation, which covers the whole spectrum from radio all the way up uh, through light uh, into X-rays, um, are vibrations in the electric and magnetic field. And Maxwell's equations tell us that you can create, um, well, obviously an electric field can be created from an electric charge, but a changing electric field creates a changing magnetic field and a changing magnetic field creates a changing electric field. So once you start a wave off, it can keep on going in a self-sustaining way and travel right across the universe. And you effectively, you, you generate a varying electric field by taking hold of a charge and shaking it. So in this picture at the bottom left, you can imagine there's an electron, say, sitting quietly in space with electric um, field lines sticking around it. And if you grab hold of it and drag it to the right, then uh, now those electric field lines are sent in a different place, but the information that the charge has moved can only propagate outwards at the speed of light. And so we have this kink in the electric field, which will then moves out, outwards uh, spherically from the, um, uh, from the electric charge. And that kink, if you like, you can think of as that, that is the electromagnetic wave. So in general, we create um, electromagnetic waves by accelerating 
electric charges. Now, this happens in nature in a variety of ways. Um, the electric charges in any material object uh, that are moving around by virtue of its uh, thermal motion uh, generate um, uh, generate electromagnetic radiation um, just because from the thermal energy. Um, electrons can be moved around by electric and magnetic fields. Um, and when an electron is accelerated by an electric magnetic field, it can radiate um, uh, radiation. And of course, in bound states in atoms, when an electron jumps from one bound state to another, it can emit or absorb um, a photon. In radio, we normally think about generating our electrons essentially by taking the electrons in a conducting wire and shaking them using uh, a varying voltage, which makes the electrons move backwards and forwards in the wire. Um, and receiving uh, radio waves is exactly the same process in reverse. Uh, an electric, uh, the changing electric field of the radiation comes in, hits our wire, makes the electrons move backwards and forwards. That generates a voltage, which we can then measure using um, uh, various kinds of lab equipment. And so the very simplest uh, uh, radio telescope you can imagine it is really based on something which just collects um, radio waves using some kind of antenna. Um, in general, we're going to have to uh, amplify the voltage that comes out of that antenna. So the, so the antenna converts free space electric field to voltage in a wire. That wire then goes into an amplifier. We make the voltage bigger. And then usually we are just interested in how much power there is in the signal, not in the actual details of the signal itself, which is usually the voltage is usually uh, random. Um, and so we have a power detector which takes that voltage, squares it, the, uh, and then averages over some period, uh, and that tells us the power that's come into our telescope. And then we collect that number and, and save it. Now, that's that simple radiometer is in practice is, is not very useful um, because uh, the electronics that we use to amplify the, the signal um, the, uh, is not are not stable. So the gains vary. We'll talk more about this, this later. And in general, the signals we're looking for in radio astronomy are extremely small. And unless the gain is very, very stable, the signal we're looking for will be swamped by the variations in the in the gain, and so we need slightly cleverer uh, systems to uh, to look at this. So again, there's going to be another lecture specifically about um, uh, receiver types. Um, but just to anticipate that slightly, one way for which we, we can effectively detect um, uh, radio waves in the in the bottom picture is if we have not only the antenna which is looking at the sky that we're interested in, but another antenna, or it doesn't have to be an antenna, just it can even just be a, a, a simple piece of electronics, uh, like a, a resistor, which isn't varying, which has no signal in it. And then we arrange a switch that switches rapidly between those two, um, and then goes through our amplifier and, and, and power detector. And so what we're basically doing is measuring the difference between the signal from the antenna, which is not looking at anything interesting, and the antenna, which is looking at the sky. And that difference we can measure um, and uh, measure accurately. And that is one way, that, that's essentially the simplest way in which we can build a, a useful radio telescope. So as I said, the, the function of an antenna in radio is to convert the incoming radiation into a voltage. And the nice thing about radio is, is once we've, the signal has gone through our antenna, it's a voltage which we can look at and play with, with um, electronics uh, devices, the same as any other voltage that we might generate in, a, uh, in any other electronic circuit. And the two you know, sort of main different ways you can think of about looking at a, um, a voltage signal uh, are as a function of time, and as a function of frequency. And so the two 
instruments that we use to look at voltages as a function of time and frequency are called the oscilloscope and the spectrum analyzer. And these are important uh, bits of equipment. And so you need to know uh, basically how they work. Um, so this is uh, roughly what each of those, um, uh, those instruments does. And as so many things uh, these days, there are the modern versions of these instruments work in a digital fashion using sample data and computers. But previously, uh, they, there was uh, versions of this which worked in a purely analog electronics fashion. And it's helpful to understand both of them, uh, even though most equipment that you like to account for these days is, is probably going to be digital. So in a, an analog oscilloscope, you have your signal coming in and it's amplified. And you also have a signal which is generated inside the instrument, which is a sawtooth, that is a voltage which ramps slowly from some uh, value up to a maximum, and then drops back to the initial value and slopes up again. And that is used to control the exposition of an electron beam on a cathode ray display. So the spot is dragged across the screen, clicks back to the beginning, is dragged across again, clicks back to the beginning, and carries on. And then the incoming signal controls the position of the spot in the y direction. And so this simply just draws a graph of the, um, uh, of the signal as a function of time. So that shows us the waveform of our signal. We're quite often interested not in the exact waveform, but in how much power there is in the signal as a function of different frequencies. So for that, we use a spectrum analyzer. Um, so in the top right, we've got a simple diagram of how a spectrum analyzer works. So again, our signal comes in and, and is amplified. But now we mix the signal. So we put it through uh, a mixer, that is a multiplier, which is connected to an oscillator. And the oscillator is, produces a varying frequency um, controlled by a sawtooth generator, like this, this oscilloscope. So what that means is that the frequency of uh, this signal is swept over some uh, defined range and then flicks back to the beginning and starts again. That has the effect of down converting, shifting our signal in frequency down to a lower value, down to and at any one time, some bit of, bit of the signal will be at the same frequency as the oscillator and will be close to zero in frequency. So we then put the signal through a filter, which cuts out all the higher frequencies and just leaves us those low frequencies close to zero. And then we detect the amount of power um, and smooth that and feed that to our cathode ray display tube. And so what that means is that at any, any instant, we're picking out the little bit of the incoming signal that's at a particular frequency and displaying that on our screen. And <coughs> the exposition on the screen is the frequency that we're selecting. And so this gives us a plot of the power at a given frequency as a function of frequency. Now you can do exactly the same thing in digital systems. In this case, it's in some senses it's a lot easier. All you do is you've got your incoming signal and you capture it with a digitizer, an analog to digital converter. And so now you have a string of numbers essentially in a computer, which are the voltages as a function of time. And you can either just tell the computer to display those voltages directly on a screen, or you can get the computer to do a Fourier transform on um, those voltages to produce a signal that's a fun function of frequency and display that instead. So that's our basic equipment that we'll, we, we would use in practical practice if we were building a, a, a telescope and, um, and getting it to work. Now we want to talk a little bit about um, what it is that we're actually measuring with the radio telescope and how we describe uh, the signals that, that we look at. So imagine, first of all, a source of radiation floating out in space somewhere, and it's producing radiation with a total power of p watts, p joules per second. Imagine drawing a sphere around that 
um, around that point. Um, and so we're sitting out on the surface of that sphere and we're looking at the, at the object. How much power do we receive? Well, the total power is spread out over uh, an area of four pi r squared. And so the amount that we see going through each square meter close to us is p over four pi r squared. And that's has the units of watts per square meter, and we call that flux, power per unit area. Now we take that signal that we've captured and we put it through our spectrum analyzer and we look at it and we see that it's the, the power is spread out over some range of frequencies. And so we can now say, well, how much power is there in any small amount of, uh, uh, of, of frequency range at a given frequency? So what we've now got is flux density. So the density refers to spectral density. So that's now the power through each square meter of, of, of receiver per each hertz of bandwidth um, in our receiver. Um, so this now has uh, the units of watts per square meter per hertz. And the, although the, the SI unit is watts per square meter per hertz, in radio astronomy, we very often use uh, this unit, which is 10 to the minus 26 of the SI unit, and we call that one Jansky. And so that's our fundamental unit of flux density. And so the way to think about that is that you have again, an, an antenna um, connected to spectralizer or some kind of receiver. And so our antenna has a certain area or uh, effective area and we're receiving signals over a certain bandwidth. And so the amount of power that we receive is the flux density of the source times the area of the antenna times the bandwidth. And conventionally we, we, uh, we say it's, it's actually a half of that because if we imagine that this source is radiating its power equally into um, all polarizations or both polarizations rather um uh, an antenna can only pick up one polarization in in each you know, channel at, at a time and so per polarization uh, you're picking up half the power and so there's a factor of two uh, a factor of a half so if we think about now uh, the uh what our antenna is is doing um so we, you think about an antenna as having an effective area that's distinct from its actual physical area. Uh, and the effective area is tells you how efficient the antenna is at collecting radiation. And it's linked very fundamentally to the size of the beam. Uh, that, that is the, the piece of solid angle in the sky from which the antenna is efficient at collecting radiation. And so uh, the relationship is that for uh, if the antenna is sensitive to a solid angle omega, then the effective area times that solid angle is equal to the square of the wavelength that you're observing at. Now, if you imagine what that means, if, if you've got an antenna which can see the whole sky at once, then omega is four pi radians, and so this gives us the effective area of an omnidirectional antenna is lambda squared over four pi. And so you can measure the gain of any other antenna that has a higher gain in some direction than, um, than omnidirectional, um, uh, essentially as a, uh, as, a, as a multiplier of that number. Now, although obviously the, the antenna, uh, our radio telescope, is collecting power from, uh, from the radio source. We actually very rarely uh, talk or think about uh, the signal as being in terms of power. Um, we much more uh, often think about it in terms of temperature. Now you might think, well, how, how does a power relate to a temperature? Um, 
but it's very straightforward because um, basically you have a you have a wire coming out of your antenna which has your signal on it, and radio sources, um, natural radio sources, produce voltages which are randomly uh, varying with time. They're not nice coherent sine waves like you would get from a radio transmitter, and um, the signal that they produce looks identical to the signal that you would get from just a resistor, uh, a thermal uh, source of radiation connected to the end of your wire. And so if you say, imagine that there was a resistor connected to my antenna, uh, to my, my, my wire rather than antenna, um, and I arrange for that resistor to be at some temperature so that it delivers exactly the same amount of power as the antenna would, then I can relate the power generated by, uh, by my antenna to a temperature. And so we can equate the noise power generated by a resistor that is equal to the power that's delivered by the antenna. So KT times the bandwidth equals the flux density times effective area times the bandwidth over two. And so that tells us that the uh, there is an uh, there is a temperature, which we call the antenna temperature, which you can think of as essentially equivalent to the strength of your signal. It's a different way of expressing the um, uh, of the power uh, in your signal, but it's effectively measuring the same thing. Um, so although it's called the antenna te temperature, it's not the temperature of the antenna. Um, it doesn't correspond to any actual physical temperature of anything uh, in, our, in our system. Uh, and for example, one um, uh, thing for that is, is that it depends on how big your antenna is. Uh, if your antenna is bigger, it will capture more power from the radio source, um, deliver more power to your receiver, and therefore be equivalent to a higher temperature. So just to give a concrete example of this, let's imagine that we were looking at uh, the Crab Nebula, um, uh, which is one of the brightest radio sources in the sky at five gigahertz, which is six centimeters of wavelength. Uh, and what's the antenna temperature? So we can take the physical area of a 26 meter antenna. Um, a dish antennas typically have um, effective areas that are about 0.7 or 0.8 of the um, of their physical area. So that gives us an effective area in square meters. The flux density of the Crab Nebula at 5 gigahertz is about 600 Janskis, so that much in SI units. And so we can work that out and you put the numbers in and you come up with an antenna temperature of about 80 Kelvin, um, which is about the temperature of liquid nitrogen. So what that means is the power that we get from our antenna uh, point at the Crab Nebula is roughly the same as we would get if we took a 50 ohm resistor uh, attached to the end of a, of, a, of a piece of coaxial line and dipped it into some liquid nitrogen. Um, and in fact, this is something that you may well actually do if you're uh, testing or calibrating your radio telescope is actually take a physical resistor, dip it into some liquid nitrogen and connect it up to your receiver and see that you get a signal about the same level as you get from the Crab Nebula, as you would expect. Um, and so this actually gives us an important number, which is um, essentially given, given by the effective area of the antenna, which is uh, sometimes called the antenna gain. So that tells us that um, we uh, that a seven and a half Jansky source would give us an, uh, um, uh, an antenna temperature of one Kelvin. And we get one Kelvin for every seven and a half Janskis. Okay, so that's flux density. Now we need to think about brightness. So brightness is very much the same concept as you would think of from the word. If you, you know, the, 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 the brightness of a, um, uh, the sky or the, a piece of paper that you would, would look at is the same concept. It's how much radiation is coming from uh, 
you know, from a certain amount of solid angle. So uh, brightness, which we, we can call I um, here, is basically tells you the amount of power that you get from an extended source of, of radiation now, not, not a point source, but something where there's radiation coming from a, a big area, um, is given by the area of your detector, the amount of bandwidth you're using now, and the solid angle of the source. So brightness is now in watts per square meter per hertz per steradian. And so if you look at that in relation to flux density, that means that flux density is the integral of brightness over solid angle. So this is one of the most important uh, uh, things to remember. Um, in radio astronomy, people are always talking uh, about sometimes about flux density, sometimes about brightness. This is the relationship between the two. So flux density is the integral of brightness over solid angle. Conversely, brightness is flux density per solid angle. So it's easy to get confused because people, they both mean how bright something is, but there is a very specific uh, uh, difference, which is to do whether it's per solid angle or not. And so the, thing, the things to remember here are the brightness of an object is a property of that object. Um, it doesn't change with how far away it is, unless it's so far away that the universe has expanded significantly since the light left the object. Um, and brightnesses in cosmology are interestingly different because of that. But ignoring that for the moment, assuming that your object isn't that far away, um, uh, if you measure the brightness of an object and you make it twice as far away, the brightness is still the same. Um, also, slightly sort of counterintuitively, a bigger telescope doesn't help you in seeing things of lower brightness. In fact, it may actually, in some cases, make things worse. Um, because if you make your telescope twice as big, um, then the solid angle of the beam goes down by a factor of two. And if you're looking at an object at a given brightness, um, the amount of signal that you see actually doesn't change. Flux density, on the other hand, um, depends on the distance to the source. If you make the source twice as far away, then the flux density will drop with the inverse square law um, by a factor of four. A bigger telescope just collects more power. So um, if you have a, uh, you're looking at the flux density of a, um, a point source, it will be easier to detect with a bigger telescope. And so, Basically, the, the, the way to think, think to think about this is if, if you're thinking about looking at point objects, that is objects small of the telescope beam, flux density is the most useful way to think about it. If you're thinking about looking at extended objects that are much bigger than your telescope beam, then think brightness temperature. Um, so I just want to talk for a moment about uh, what it is actually that, that, that makes radio astronomy if you like, distinct or different from other branches of, 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 of observational astronomy, looking at, at other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite an important uh, sort of distinction. It's, it's sort of fundamental to the way that radio telescope technology works and also to some of the concepts that, that we use to describe radio radiation. So we have the whole range of um, electromagnetic uh, radiation. Um, and an important, uh, you know, very you know, fundamental concept in radiation is the idea of the, the black body curve. So this is the brightness as a function of frequency uh, for a body which is 100% efficient at absorbing and emitting thermal radiation. Um, so, uh, which is, you know, is actually true for, for many uh, real physical objects are, are good approximations to, um, to black bodies. And uh, this was obviously uh, studied by um, Max Planck originally, 
uh, who worked out the, the shape of this curve. Um, he actually did it by carefully studying the spectra um, of the light that came out of uh, ovens, which were carefully set to, uh, to different temperatures. And if you plot the brightness and the frequency on a log-log scale like this, what you see is that depending on the temperature of the object you're looking at, um, you get this curve, which is always the same shape. It goes up in a straight line, which is a, say, a power law, at um, low frequency, longer wavelengths. And then at some point it turns over and then drops very, very steeply. Uh, and as your object gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the frequency of the peak goes up, um, but the level of the uh, curve goes up as well, so that it's always uh, a hotter object is always brighter at all wavelengths than a colder object, but a hotter object has its peak of brightness at a higher frequency than a cold object. Now the equation that Planck uh, came up with, that, which describes this, um, you can write in this form, it's Textbooks usually write in a slightly simplified form, but the the reason for writing it out like this is because it shows you the um, the two parts of the curve, if you like, uh, very clearly. So this term here, which has got the uh, the quantum bits in the Planck's uh, the Planck's constant, uh, if you think about this for a moment, if h nu over k t is very small um, compared to one then this term here it becomes one essentially. And so at low frequencies compared to the temperature, um, the plot simply looks like this. Um, I is 2kt at d squared over c squared. And that turns out to be the form of the radiation curve that you would predict treating um, radiating electrons as classical oscillators with no quantum effects at all. Um, now, clearly, you can't have that behavior going on forever because that says the brightness goes up and up and up the higher you go in frequency. And this was one of the big problems and then discoveries of, of late 19th century, early 20th century physics was what happens to this curve actually? Um, why doesn't it keep on going up forever? And the answer is quantum mechanics. Um, so basically what happens is that once the radiation that you're producing is energetic enough, you have to start taking into account the fact that radiation is not produced continuously, it's produced in discrete quanta. And if you go to a high enough frequency, there isn't enough energy in your object to actually produce a photon of the, uh, the, the energy that would, it would like to, to emit. And so it can't emit. The, uh, the radiation, and that's how this curve drops off and eventually and drops off very steeply to down to zero, um, because there, there isn't enough energy in your object to produce a photon that can carry the energy away. So the point about all, all this is then if you look at what we call the radio part of the spectrum, is basically the part of the spectrum which at all temperatures of any object you're likely to encounter in the universe, we are firmly in the non-quantum, what's called the Rayleigh genes part of the spectrum. And so in radio, we can always treat our um, radiation as being wave-like and not particle-like. We don't have to think about counting photons. Um, we can always think about our radiation as being a wave. And that's really what defines the radio, the radio part of the spectrum. If we look at the optical part of the spectrum, um, then here it's, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in light, things which are hot enough to be emitting x-rays look like continuous sources, but things which are much colder than the temperature of the sun look like um, uh, you know, they emit effectively relatively few photons, and if we look at the, all the rest, the rest of the spectrum, by the time we get up to X-rays, basically any object at any uh, at any sensible temperature in the X-rays, you should think about X-rays as being um, uh, discrete photons, discrete particles, rather than 
continuous waves. So this leads us to a, um, another uh, approximation or, or convention in how we talk about uh, radiation in radio astronomy, which is because we're almost always in this uh, Rayleigh genes part of the Planck curve where we can simply relate temperature, brightness and frequency using <coughs> this part of the Planck equation and forget this bit. We can use this as a definition of uh, essentially it's a linking temperature and brightness together. So if you've measured the brightness of your object at some particular frequency, you can simply apply this equation and define a temperature, which is just given by the brightness you've measured times lambda squared over, uh, over 2k. And we call that then the Rayleigh genes brightness temperature. And again, it's another convenient shorthand way of describing um, uh, a real, the real physical uh, uh, concept here, which is brightness. Um, but uh, it makes sense in the in the radio regime, but you just have to remember um, that it's not ac actually a real temperature unless you do happen to be looking at a black body um, in the radio regime. But for example, if you are looking at an object with a spectrum like this, which is very, very far from being a black body, this might be something emitting synchrotron radiation, then you can observe at a particular frequency and say, you know, we might observe at 100 gigahertz here and we would say oh look this um this object is producing the same brightness as a black body would at 30,000 uh sorry 300,000 uh sorry 100 gigahertz at 300 kelvin or at 10 gigahertz you would say oh it matches up this uh this curve which is 300,000 kelvin so at different frequencies, the same object has very different brightness temperatures, but they're just a shorthand for um, uh, really for saying what the brightness of the object is. It's the, the brightness is the physical quantity that we actually measure. And so again, in, in this regime, uh, we can, uh, where well, we use these Rayleigh genes brightness temperatures, we can take this definition, put that together with our definition <coughs> of flux density as being brightness multiplied by solid, some solid angle. And so we end up with this formula, S over omega equals 2kt over lambda squared, which links the observed flux density at a particular wavelength and the Rayleigh Dean's brightness temperature. So Again, some of this is just, it's, it's old conventions as to uh, that, that radio astronomers have adopted over the years for how we talk about um, brightnesses and physical quantities that we, that we measure, but you need to know uh, because all radio astronomy literature uses, um, uses these definitions. Okay, so we've talked about the signal that, the, um, uh, that we detect with a telescope. Now we need to talk about the noise which prevents us from measuring the, the signal. So there are lots of sources of noise. Um, the atmosphere that the, um, the signal has to pass through um, generates noise. Um, it radiates um, like a, a black body. The uh, the electronics in the telescope, the amplifier generates noise, the mirrors, uh, the, you know, the, the metal of the antenna, although metal is a very good reflector, it's not perfect, it, it loses a little bit of the signal that, that reflects off it and generates a little bit of noise. So there are always, if you break your telescope system down into every individual component which lies between the object you're looking at and the final detection. There's a whole sequence of, of objects, each of which um, adds a little bit of noise and has a gain, um, which for all the things that we've been talking about has a gain which is less than one. Actually, we, we lose some of the signal. Eventually, of course, we get to an amplifier 
which has a gain which is very much bigger than one and makes our, our signal larger. Um, but the so but the way so the way we want to think about this then is that we have this chain of, of components and each one of those chains, the component parts of the chain has a gain and a noise temperature. Um, now we'd like to come up with a single number that describes how much noise the whole system generates, um, which is uh, you know what we're then trying to detect our signal against that noise. So to do that, what we have to do is essentially imagine is try to put all the sources of noise in the same place so we can add them up on the same basis. So imagine that we take each source of noise in the signal and we move it from where it is to the very beginning of the signal chain. So we take the T2 that was generated here and we move it um, as if it was back here, right at the beginning of the chain. Now we've moved it the other side of this first gain element. And so uh, we have to say, imagining the, the, the noise source at this position, it looks now like that, that noise source has had its, um, uh, its amplitude reduced by G1, because if you imagine taking that signal T2 over G1, putting it through the first stage with a gain of G1, that would give us a temperature T2 on the second stage, as we had before. And so on for every other step in the system, each component in the system, if we want to reference that to the beginning of the system, we have to, we can take it back here, but then we have to divide it by all the gain that's come before it. And so the total noise in the system, so we, so we can now pretend that we've got a completely noiseless system where all the noise is generated at the very beginning, that total noise is the noise of the first component plus the noise of the second component divided by the gain that comes before it plus the noise of the third component divided by the gain that comes before it and so on for as many components as we have in the system. And this is known as the Friis equation and it's again it's an absolutely fundamental equation in, in uh, thinking about receivers in, in astronomy um, because this determines how much noise there's going to be in our signal and how difficult it's going to be to uh, to detect signals. And what you can see is that components that have gain less than one, that is lossy components, are bad for two reasons. One is a lossy component generates more noise in itself, but also you know, the contribution of the next thing in the system is going to be made bigger if G is very much less than one. Um, so lossy components in your signal, uh, in your signal chain are bad. Eventually you'll get to the amplifier in your signal. Now the gain of the amplifier is going to be a very, very large number. I mean, a typical um, uh, amplifier might have a, um, a power gain of 10,000, for example. Um, and so once the gain chain includes an amplifier, G, this product of all these Gs becomes very big and the noise contribution of everything that comes after it then becomes very small and we can start worrying. Um, but all the things which come before the amplifier, which have uh, Gs less than one, where we lose a little bit of signal coming on, these are all gonna to contribute to the noise uh, in our system. Okay, so now we know what signal we've got and we know how to calculate the noise in the system. So now finally we can look at sensitivity, which is signal to noise. So we've expressed the strength of our, um, our astronomical signal in terms of antenna temperature. We've expressed our the noise in our system uh, uh, as a temperature as well. So we've got two temperatures. And so we can now say, well, what's the signal to noise? How, with what certainty have we detected a given signal? And this now then depends 
on basically on the number of measurements of the signal and the noise that we make. So obviously if you have many individual measurements of a signal and you add them up, then the total size increases with the number of uh, samples you take. Noise signals, noise voltages are random. And if you take a whole bunch of random numbers and add them up, the total only goes up as the square root of the number of samples that you've taken. So if you're taking the average, then if you average n things together, so you have n times bigger divided by n, you know, one, your noise, you average uh, you, things together, you end up with a signal which is uh, root n bigger divided by n to get the average, you have root n. So the signal to noise improves as, a, as the square root of the number of samples that you take. So just to see exactly what that looks like, imagine that this is an actual signal that we're going to produce. So this is, this is going to be, I say, a brief burst of signal. This might be a pulse from a pulsar, say, and the actual power in the signal looks like that. So the voltage that we would measure if we looked at it on an oscilloscope, uh, looking very, very fast at our signal, here is a burst of, of power, which follows um, uh, the, uh, the, the signal that we've, we've put in. And we're observing that in the presence of this noise. Now, if we just take those two and add them together, that's what one instance of the signal looks like. And as you can see, you can't really see the signal. But we observe this many times. And so if we take the power in the signal for one um, uh, instance, you don't see very much. But if we integrate that together, take, so we take 10 times as many samples, something there, 100 samples, it's looking very clear now, and then 10,000 samples, we've now recovered the signal that we, that we put in. Um, and that's just because we've just taken more and more data. Um, the signal has averaged linearly, the noise has gone down as a square root of the number of samples. So we can put this in an equation. Um, so uh, if you have a, uh, a set of uh, uh, a Gaussian, um, set of Gaussian random numbers, um, which are representing our system temperature, then it turns out that if you average n samples together, um, the RMS fluctuation that's left after averaging n samples is root 2 times T cis divided by square root of n. Uh, if you're interested in the proof of that, it's in, um, I believe, an appendix to the uh, Essential uh, Radio Astronomy um, online textbook. Um, if we are, so what is the question is, what is n? If we are observing a signal with a bandwidth, say delta nu, and you observe for a time tau, then there's a theorem in um, signal processing called Nyquist theorem that says that there are two delta nu times tau independent samples, in independent numbers present in, uh, in that signal. So n in this case is two delta nu times tau. And so the RMS of the noise that we get is root two T cis over root N, which gives us T cis over root delta nu tau. And so that's, if we set the, um, the antenna temperature and the uh, T cis equal to each other, we get a signal to noise of one when those two things are equal. So the signal to noise uh, that we get is T cis over root uh, bandwidth times integration time. And we can convert that into flux density if we want to, rather than, um, rather than an antenna temperature, because it's basically the same thing. So this tells us basically whether we're going to detect our signal or not. Um, 
uh, if we know how bright our source is, uh, uh, this tells us or tells us the noise level on an observation that we make the telescope with the given system temperature, bandwidth, and integration time. Now, that's not quite the final answer, <clears throat> because as we said right at the beginning, um, a simple radiometer um, suffers from the fact that the gain is not perfectly constant. And the problem is that the gain of the system is multiplying the system temperature. And the system temperatures can generally be very much bigger than the antenna temperature of the thing that you're trying to measure. So you know, if your system temperature is 100 Kelvin and you're trying to measure a source with an antenna temperature of one Kelvin, but your gain varies by 10%, then that's a variation of 10 Kelvin that will easily swamp the signal that you're looking for. So um, if you look at what happens in, in real instruments, even though there, there are a variety of physical processes which give rise to gain instability, um, they all tend to have very much the same effect, which is the gain wanders around in uh, a way which looks which looks like this. Um, it has fluctuations on small scales, but it has much bigger fluctuations on larger scales. And if you look at the, if you take the Fourier transform of this and look at it in frequency space, what you see is basically something which has a lot of power at low frequency, and then the power goes down steadily as essentially one over the frequency. Um, and so this is now a source of noise in your measurement alongside just the pure thermal noise. And so the, so in fact, the full version of the radiometer equation um, is, uh, is this. You have, there's two independent sources of noise. There's the thermal noise, which gives us our one over bandwidth times time. And then that has to be added in quadrature with whatever residual gain fluctuations are left after we've designed our system as well as we can. And so if you then look at the, the noise in your system as a function of frequency, what you generally see is that at the higher frequencies, that's short times over short time scales, you've got the white noise level that you would calculate here. But on longer time scales, if you've got some residual gain fluctuations in your system, then the noise is bigger um, because you're in this, uh, this part of the spectrum, which is going up as the frequency goes down. And this effectively means that the longer you observe for, um, if you observe for longer, longer times, that's lower and lower frequencies, your noise level will be higher. And so a lot of uh, range storing receiver, receiver design and system design is about making sure that you don't end up in this situation where you're trying to measure something in the presence of this much larger noise. Okay, so to summarize then, um, what have we do, learned? Radio waves are the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that's dominated by wave-like rather than photon-like behavior. So we can always think of radio waves rather than radio photons. We collect radiation from a region of the sky that's defined by the size of our antenna in wavelengths. We can think about the power that's received either in terms of Flux density, which is more appropriate for point-like sources, power per square meter per hertz, or for extended objects, uh, we can think about flux density per solid angle. We can convert uh, brightness into a pseudo temperature. Uh, we can pretend that the, we're observing the Rayleigh genes part Planck spectrum, even if we're not, and that gives us a way of express expressing brightness as temperature. Um, that allows us then to think about noise in terms of temperature as well, so we can directly can co compare two temperatures. Noise arises from everything on our telescope between the source and the detector, um, and uh, losses in components before the first amplifier uh, conspire to hit us in two ways by contributing noise themselves and by amplifying um, the noise uh, contribution of the components for them. 
um, the white noise that we measure then goes down as the square root of uh, data samples. So simply by observing for longer or over more bandwidth, we can reduce our noise, except when we can't then become uh, limited by the stability of our instrument. And how we get over that, um, we'll talk about in the uh, lecture on uh, receiver design. Okay, thanks very much.